Great. Oh, it's good to see you. And uh, oh, again. see the problem now. I got three things wrapped around my ears. I feel like my ears are constantly sticking right out because there's the mask, and then is this this thing. And I, I am really an old friend now. I got two hearing aids, so I'm uh, I'm deaf. So every time I take my mask off, my hearing aids are popping out all over the place. So I'm okay. Um, I yeah, nice to see you. I can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, who's out there? Um, it's darkness and all these lights. And then I'm looking at that screen. Look at it. I look, I look like I'm on a game show or something. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. If I go like this. Five things that you find. Who knows the show? Five things that you find in a tea shop. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like family fortunes, isn't it? This is great. I love what you've done to the place. It's really nice. <laughs> it's great. And it feels really strange now because, you know, I was thinking of, ah, oh, it's going to be really nice coming back. But it doesn't feel like normal coming back, does it? And then here's the other thing. I've never felt so tall in all my life. <laughs> like this. Just, uh, there we go. We better get started. I think Pete said I've got 10 minutes or something like that. No. There we go. No, it is good to see you. Um, just a book recommendation to start. It's kind of connected into, into what I want to speak about this evening. Uh, so over the, the summer, maybe something like that, I was reading this, um, this book, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. It's a great title. The Patient, The Patient Ferment. You know what fermented does? You know that? Of the Early Church. Listen, here's the subtitle. The Improbable Rise of Christianity in the Roman Empire by Alan Creeder. It's, it's a great, great book. Um, and, and, and as I'm reading the book, I've, I've just been fascinated for a long, long time. I've been fascinated with different periods of, of history where um, the, the church or the, the gospel really rooted in a community has made such a big impact, a transformative impact into that community and people's lives. And, and try to kind of discern as you're reading. So what were some of the key characteristics in that? What, what was going on? What was going on then, maybe that is different? And what can we learn from that? And we can't replicate the past. We can't go back there and do things exactly the same in every way because we're in a different context, a different time in history. What, what was it? And, and two of the things, really, that I picked up from this book, there's so many, but, but two of the things, broad categories, that we just got time to skim over the surface of here, here this evening. Number one, um, they were a people small communities of faith, households of faith, who were deeply rooted in the presence of God. And, and almost, I mean, I've got two points. The first one, I think Claire covered it in that right at the beginning, um, in all that she said, they were, they were people who were deeply rooted in the presence of God. And, and the second thing then, they were people who were deeply rooted in place. And, and that was one of the significant things. And that, it's worth a read just for that. What does that mean? to be deeply rooted in place. So as, um, as Gavin read to us fr from the start, uh, the, some of us heard, did you hear? Yeah, you, did you hear without? Mm. Yeah, good. Yeah, well done. Um, so you, you know the, the Psalms, the whole books, the three books of the Psalms begins with this picture of a tree that is planted. Um, deeply rooted into streams of, of water. And, and it's intended to be a picture of, of, a, of, of a person, this person and who, whose life flourishes and such that their life is fruitful. They produce fruit from their life because of where they're, they're rooted. So uh, um, th th this tree isn't dependent on surrounding circumstances. It's not dependent upon rains. Uh, it's not dependent upon the weather around it for, in order for it to be fruitful because the source of its nourishment, this is ongoing nourishment from the ground. The, the stream continues to, to flow. And, and, and in this psalm, that, that, that rootedness is, is the person who delights and meditates. Those are the two words. And they delight in, in the law of the Lord. They delight in the ways of God in the heart of God, in, in his command, his ways. And, and on these ways, they meditate, they chew it over, day and, and night. And so 
in the doing, in being deeply rooted in the presence of God, connected, abiding in, in God, so their lives produce this fruit for others, that others can partake of that fruit. There's something from their lives that impact beyond them uh, and, and pr uh, provide shade for, for others and, and so on. But there's a sense of permanency here. This is the deep rootedness. Um, their, their leaf doesn't wither in all seasons. There's, there's, a, there's a permanency to it. And, and then remember in contrast to that, uh, God's words through the prophet Jeremiah in, um, <laughs> do you know, sorry, I'm just thinking, I just went like that. My, when, when my daughter said to me last week, Dad, because um, I, I was speaking off a stage last week, and she said, Dad, when you're on the stage, you don't need to elevate yourself so people can see you anymore. <laughs> And I'm like, I don't, I don't go on my toes. Does anybody notice I go? Yeah, I, was like, <laughs> I just noticed it. Sorry. Um, so in Jeremiah chapter 2, here's, what, here's God speaking. And, and he says, my, my, my people, they've committed these two evils against me. First of all, um, they've forsaken me. Do you remember what he says? The spring, the fountain, the springs of living waters. And they, they've dug out for themselves these, these broken sisters and can't hold water. And here's the same picture. See, this is the life of God. I, I, my, my heart's desire for my people is they thrive and they flourish in all seasons. But they've left that. They, they're no longer rooted there. They're no longer abiding there. They're looking for other ways. Back to Eden, isn't it? Oh, we can do it our own way. We can find our own sources of life and vitality and so on. There's this root system of flourishing that is, is available to us. Um, circumstances all around can be can be difficult and and, and here's one of the things Th those early communities you see these weren't easy times and far from it um, certain periods of those first 300 years of the, of the church like severe persecution and and the thing that marked them out one of the things that marked them out and caused this exponential growth patient slow but multiplication of growth, the thing that marked them out was this hope that was in them, this, this life that wasn't dependent upon good times, good circumstances, everything going well for them. They were, they were more deeply rooted in that. Remember what Peter says? Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you, which implies people are going to say, and they did, what's this thing that you have? What's this distinctive? How is it that you, you still live yeah, you still sorrow, you, you, you still experience tough stuff, pain, bereavement, all, all of that. And yet there's this vitality, there's this life, there's this hope that you still have. Um, life is full of un unexpected storms. <laughs> I mean, these last, I don't know, 18 months and, and all that that's brought with it. And there's, it's always this, there's this crises and there's this traumas and there's disappointments and there's failures and there's disasters and there's losses and and people let us down and people hurt us and and there's all kinds of stuff there's all there's all this stuff on the outside uh, but but the question is in all of that where, where are we rooted or where are we dwelling or is Jesus words where are we abiding where are we making our home if you like. Um, listen to this. Psalm 27 begins with these words. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries, my foes, though an army encamp against me, though a war rise up against me. Do, do, do you see the context here? Before Psalm 27, there's a few verses, people, nuggets, people love to quote certain verses in Psalm 27, but here's the context. It's like, everyone's against me. It's all coming against me. That's, that's the context of these words. This trouble, this conflict, this pressure all around. This is a storm. And so, David, how do you respond in that? What, what do you do in that? Well, this is where he takes us. He takes us into the scene of the tabernacle, the place of God's presence. All of these conflicts, or, or as Paul says in, in um, 2 Corinthians, is it um, harassed from within and without? Have you ever felt like that? <laughs> there's stuff going on inside me, and there's stuff going on outside of me, and it's everywhere. Where do you go with that? Well, David says, here's where I find my 
strength. Here's where I can find my confidence. It is in this place. It's in the place of God's presence. He says, one thing I desire. Remember those words? One thing I desire and that I seek after. And I love that. It's, it doesn't only desire it. Sometimes we stop at the desiring. Like, oh, I would love to know more of God's presence in my life. I would love to know what it means to abide in his presence. and experience. Uh, but, but he didn't just desire it. So he goes after it. I'm going after this. This is, this is really important. David says, one thing that I may dwell. I love that word. I've pondered a long time on that word. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord, the place of his presence, all the days of my life. Conflicts, armies, everything is against me. I want to dwell here, the presence of God. It's a word that um, comes up throughout the scriptures, you know, dwell, and particularly in the New Testament, in the Gospel of, of John, 63 times. Um, Jesus invites us to dwell in him or abide in him, make our home in him as he dwells, abides in us and, and, and actually this is just this is fundamentally crucial if we're going to bear any fruit if we're going to provide any shade as it were if we're going to have any impact beyond ourselves if this good stuff that's going to come within and out of us and our lives are going to flourish this is so so crucial so jesus says john 15 this is um, jesus says Remember, apart from me, you can do nothing. I mean, that's, that's blunt, isn't it? So, you know, I'm, I'm, I can do lots of activity. I can get involved in good stuff and whatever. But if I'm not deeply rooted here, if I'm not soaking up the, the, the life nourishment, the source of his presence, the spirit of God filling my life, meditating and delighting and dwelling he says you're not going to produce anything that's going to last so think about making a cup of tea um some of you are dippers right you know what i mean when i say that i've got somebody um in, in the office with us who they you ask if you want a cup of tea you get um a weak one what do you mean by that just in and out how many hands up if you do that with your tea? In and out. You do that? In and out. I'm like, what's the point of that? Just have another drink. Drink something else. Bing. Dippers. And then there are others, you know, you dwell us. Right? You dwell. So you put the bag in and you allow the, the hot water to dwell in the tea bag. Yeah? And you allow the tea bag to dwell in the hot water and, and you allow it to linger there. And some of you say, well, no, it's too strong, too strong. Ah, that's the point. Strong, you see. That's dwell. It's long, isn't it? You can't, you shouldn't even say the word dwell quickly. Dwell. That's what it is. It's lingering. It's lingering. And, you know, um, sometimes we can, we can be dippers when it comes to our, our relationship, our connectivity, our abiding, if you like, our rootedness, or we can become dippers. So we, we dip into maybe the, the word of God. I was saying this to somebody the other day. Um, you know, I, I, have you come across Lectio 365, this app that you can get on your phone, this the prayer 24 7 thing? You know, it's, it's a great app. And, and <laughs> sometimes I, I put it on and I think, you can either read it or listen to it. And I, I, I'm going to read it because it takes too long listening. And they have all these gaps with music in the background. And, you, and, they say, and, and it's encouraging you. Well, let's silence all of those scattered thoughts and whatever and dwell in his presence. And I'm like, I've got things to do. I've got to get on with my day. Just read it through. Okay, you know, I've seen that bit before. That's there every day. And you're finished. And you can dip into prayer. Well, that's great that you're able to do that. But, but, but your life becomes that, oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> that's it. And, and you can dip into community, the community of God's people and life in, in the community of God's people. And here's what we think we all do, to dwell, dwell as in, in his presence. Without me, you can do nothing. <clears throat> Robert Melholland um, says uh, that there's two ways of living in the world. 
We can be in the world for God, or we can be in God for the world. And, and there's a fundamental difference, you know. We can be in the world for God, or we can be in God for the sake of the world. Well, Jesus invites us to live a life that dwells and, and abides uh, well in God. Uh, it's the kind of life that produces much fruit. And, and, and of course, I'm just looking at the clock. I'm just trying to work out. We started. I don't even know. Um, I'm going to go quick. Okay. Um, you know, one of my favorite passages in the whole of the Bible, and I think probably spoken a number of times when I was here, is Isaiah chapter 61. Um, and, and it's a text that Jesus reads right at the beginning of his ministry um, on earth when he's in the synagogue in, in Nazareth. Um, and he, he, he reads it out and then he declares that this scripture has been fulfilled, you see, in, in the people's hearing of it. Let me just read it out quickly to you again. So this is what he says. This is what he reads out. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to pro proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed, to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, as, as jubilee when all the lost things will be restored and, and the reset button's gonna be pressed and the wrong things will be made right, God shalom. To all who mourn, he'll give a crown of ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, listen to this, that is, in their being set right, all of these people, these, these broken ones, these mourning ones, those who grieve, those who have been in captivity, and so on, in their being set right, they, brokenhearted, they press the mourning, will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. They are going to be the broken ones. Are you, are you one of those broken ones who've... The Lord has begun to do this work through his spirit of restoring, bringing the broken pieces and putting them back together. I've certainly had that and continue to have that in my life in so many ways. These ones, us ones, I'm going to plant them like great oaks. And this is what they're going to do. He says, for my own glory. He says, this is what we're going to do. They will rebuild ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them. Though they've been deserted for many generations, he's taken the broken pieces and he's putting them back together. But then he sets them, he plants them in place. He plants them in place. You're gonna become the means, he says, by which ancient ruins, that is the brokenness as a consequence of the curse of sin, you're gonna be part of the restoring of God's shalom. The Bible um, can be summed up as a narrative in four movements. Um, the creation of God's shalom, that is his harmony, his wholeness, the way things are meant to be, that's shalom. Um, the creation of it, um, the, the vandalism of it, Genesis chapter three, the brokenness of that, um, the, the redemption of God's shalom, buying it back, that's what Jesus did for us, Calvary and the cross, um, and then the restoring and that's as a work has begun, will find its completion. It's a work that's begun. And he says, you're going to be part of that. You're going to be part of this rebuilding. You will bring renewal and revival to culture, to cities, to towns. It's, it's this picture of restoration. And it's about being deeply rooted in place. So those who put down their roots into Jesus, this is part of that work of restoring in you, I'm going to plant you so that you impact areas for rebuilding. Um, I, I don't know much, how much, I should even use this illustration, I don't think. Um, I, I don't know how much about sailing you know. <laughs> just like, you know and I know nothing at all, okay? So I just, um, but I, I, I know there are three major components, I think, that must work together in order for the boat to move. Get the engine for a moment, okay? There's no engine on the sailboat. So you have the blowing of the wind. You need, Right so far? Can you do yeah. See? One out of three. Okay, come on. Um, and then you have a sail that catches the wind, right? So you need something there. Yeah? But then you have a keel underneath the boat that links the boat to the sea, counteracting the force of the wind and the sail. Yes! Okay, you get any illustrations so far? So you got the wind. What do we pray for? Holy Spirit, come and blow. 
and the influence of your presence. We need to be receptive to that. Remember somebody saying to me years ago when I was a young lad and part of the church, he says, Gareth, Gareth, my son. <laughs> he says, always remember when the wind is blowing, put up your sail. Put up your sail. Be receptive. Get in the way. But there needs to be a connection as well. There needs to be a connection to place in order for there to be any influence. And, and we can rightly speak about and pray into the need for the Spirit of God to come and, and, and put ourselves in that way. But we, we need to be in place, in a context, if we want to see renewal, if we want to see the restoration of God's shalom in communities and in culture. I think... It takes being rooted into local context. And, and that's why I asked for, for Jeremiah 29 to, to be read, the, these verses. Um, here's the, the context of that. People have been taken into exile in, in what was the biggest city in the world at the time in, in Babylon. Uh, and, and there were these two significant forces at work with these people in, in exile. First of all, there was assimilation. So the Babylonians, this is, this is the way they kind of operated. Uh, unlike the, the Egyptians, when they were taken into captivity, they, where there was subjugation, we're gonna press them down, we're gonna control them. The Babylonians, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna make you like us so that you lose your distinctiveness. You no longer stand out, you're just like us. So there was assimilation from the Babylonians, but then the opposite force was this segregation. So the religious leaders amongst them were saying to the people, now keep yourselves apart, separate yourselves from Babylon, live out here in a little enclave, let's protect ourselves from those evil people until we get home. Let's wait it out until we get home. And again, I think this is a message for the church. Sometimes the message can be, well, let's hold on tight until we go home. Maybe even to the point of, you know, you draw, draw up the bridge and you're in a safe place. Let's just enjoy ourselves together. And every so often, we'll do a mission. We'll lower the bridge. Let's go out and see how many we can get, pull them back in, up the bridge again. Ah, churches operate in that way over years past. And that, that, that's, that's not the message. See, God speaks to Jeremiah and he says, hang on, these prophets who were saying this stuff to you, I didn't say that. They're false prophets. I didn't say separate yourselves and sit in this conflict. Actually, here's what I want you to do. Evil Babylon, remember, I want you to move into the city, build houses Settle down, dwell there, plant gardens. Plant a garden, you're there for a long time, okay? Have sons and daughters and seek, listen, the shalom and the prosperity of the city. Well, that's a different picture, isn't it? Now, you're not being assimilated to be like them. Remain distinct, but influence for the good. Live for the sake of the blessing of the place in which you've been planted. Live as though you're here to stay, not as though you're in a waiting room ready to go to heaven when you die. That's how I bring renewal to a city, those who have been rooted in presence, rooted now in place for the sake of the blessing of those that you live amongst. I'm just about done. You'd be pleased to know. You know, there's a big difference between a miner and a farmer um, or a gardener. Um, one is about, the miner really is about all that they can get out of the place, all that they can extract. Um, it's about removing these minerals from the ground until it's completely depleted, and then you simply move on to another place where you can extract until it's depleted. That's, that's, that's the miner. What can I get out of this to benefit me? That's the, that's, that's the message there. And, and increasingly, I think in our consumer age, right, um, we, we live in this culture that's marked by transience on every level. And I feel this. Um, it makes for a very fragile environment. Um, Eugene Peterson wrote this book, uh, excellent book again, uh, Long Obedience in the Same Direction. It's a great title. Long it's like this patient film, a long obedience in the same direction. This is what he says in the introduction. Listen to this. There's a great market for a religious experience in our world. 
There is little enthusiasm for the patient acquisition of virtue, little inclination to sign up for a long apprenticeship in what earlier generations of Christians called holiness. Christianity in our time has been captured by the tourist mindset. It's understood as we visit an attractive site to be made when we have adequate time. For some, it's a weekly jaunt to church. For others, occasional visits to special services, some with a desire for religious entertainment or, or a sacred diversion. We go to see a new personality or get a new experience. What is the latest? What is the newest? We'll try anything until something new comes along. It is the long obedience in the same direction which the mood of the world does so much to discourage the influence of the world. The Taurus mindset doesn't fit with being deeply rooted in place. And I think the technological age, for all the good things that benefits from that, hi everybody out there, um, this is what, what happens. It's like, you got Netflix church now. Whoa, what should we watch this week? <laughs> Isn't it? Transience. We love it. Oh, they do great worship over there. Let's tune into these guys over here. And where should we go? I think um, I know some people. I was just going to say their names. I won't because um, we're on here. Um, five churches every Sunday. It's like, oh, we love a bit of that. And we love a bit of that. We love a bit of that. And that's okay. I'm not saying that's all bad. I don't think. But deeply rooted in place. And I, just, I don't just mean a town. I mean a community in relationship. You're part of a people who are putting on display through their lives together something of the taste of the kingdom of God, a covenant commitment to one another. I need to move on. Let, let me just finish this. I think I'm going to finish this. Yeah, there's an ancient vow that I came across that um, was part of this church order that is pretty intense. And, and you might hear this and say, oh, hang on, this sounds legalistic and all the rest of it. Okay, but just, just listen to it. Uh, it's something about I love. This is, this is the vow that they made. Okay, if you come into a membership, and this just, I've got to finish now, haven't I? Uh, come in, come in. <laughs> they're like, he said that before. If we don't go up now, he's never going to stop. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, What's this is the point you turned me off, isn't it? <laughs> Listen, listen to this, okay? So this was kind of the membership thing, you know? If, if there's such a thing as membership. We vow to remain all of our life with our local community. We live together, pray together, work together. We give up the temptation to move from place to place in search of an ideal situation. And when interpersonal conflicts arise, we have a great incentive to work things out and to restore peace because we can't go anywhere else. We've made the vow, that's what they're saying. This means learning the practices of love, acknowledging one's own offensive behavior, giving up one's preferences, forgiving. This is, this is covenant, this is covenant. You see, if we just move from the individual, me being planted in a particular place, and hopefully there's fruit, into what God desires, the impact of community, bound together, covenanted together in relationship, in place, in a particular locality, in an area, where something is put on display through their relationships to one another and their collective heart for blessing the community. There's something powerful in that. Without him, you can do nothing, mind. Deeply rooted in presence and then together being deeply rooted in place. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your overwhelming weight of love towards us. Thank you that you are fixed in love towards us. Um, thank you that you have committed yourself to us. You've covenanted yourself to us. And nothing can separate us from that love. Lord, we desire and we will seek after together um, that place where you dwell to dwell in your presence, to be rooted in your presence in order to be a blessing for the sake of the prosperity and for the peace and for the rebuilding of our town. And we pray that you would help us. Holy Spirit, would you blow as we set our sails and we set down our roots. In Jesus' name, amen.